All right, the title of my sermon is In the Days of Noah, in the Days of Noah. And the part of the chapter I want to focus on is in, down in verse number 26. The Bible reads, And as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Now jump over to Luke 21 real quick. Luke 21. And I want to kind of lay a foundation for, for the sermon this morning, for what I'm talking about. Look at verse number 25 of Luke 21. Verse number 25. It says, And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, and lift your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is at hand. So we see right here in Luke chapter number 21, we see the events that are leading up to the rapture. And we see uh, in Luke 17 that these events are also described, talking about the revealing or the coming of the Son of Man. And while I was reading this, this is not necessarily uh, on topic uh, of, of or the point of the sermon, but look down at verse number 28. And, and I was looking at it this morning and reading some things, and this just really stood out to me and... It was kind of a really uh, a powerful thing to think about. It says, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And I got such a blessing out of reading that verse this morning because you think about it. If you read the events of the end times and just the, this great tribulation that's going to overtake us someday, you think about it, if they're arresting Christians, they're arresting them. You think about watching your friends and your family members getting arrested, getting their heads removed from their bodies for the cause of Christ, just this just you know police state that, that just takes over the entire world and the wickedness that this world is going. Just think about how bad that is. Just you know every day would be about survival. Am I gonna make it today or am I gonna watch my entire family, you know, people to pull up and th you know wearing you know the the, uh, uh, the military garb, throw them in some kind of van, haul them off, try them, and, and execute them. Just think about how bad that time would be. And look what it says. When these things become to, uh, begin to come to pass, he says, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Can you imagine how dark that time would be? And then you look up and you see the heavens roll back as a scroll and you see the Lord Jesus Christ step out and call us together. What an awesome thing and what an awesome sight that will be. It's not a fairy tale that we will behold that. Isn't that awesome? And if we're dead and that doesn't happen in our lifetime, then you know what? Hey, hey, we'll be gone on and we'll be with Christ already, but we'll get to see, we'll get to see that. You know, can you imagine that? But what a great uh, uh, sight and what a great thought to have. But we see the events of the rapture being described in Luke 17, being described in Luke 21. And it's a chronology that can be followed with the rapture in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Revelation chapter number 6. It all catalogs this timeline of the coming of the Lord. And all of them are consistent that the events that happen, uh, 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 you know, that leading up to the rapture and that the tribulation, it says, or I'm sorry, that the rapture happens immediately after the tribulation, Okay. There's a doctrine out there that many of us are probably familiar with, many of us probably believe growing up, called the pre-tribulation rapture. It's the teaching that Jesus can come back at any minute, that Jesus could come back today, you know, before this service is out, Jesus could come back, uh, you know, uh, altars are filling all over the building, right? People are, get, or people are really getting saved, you know? But it's this idea that Jesus can come back at any minute. I've heard that so many times throughout the course of my life. And the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus cannot come back at any minute, okay? Amen. Jesus can't come back today. It's just, it, it, it won't happen, okay? Revelation 1, verse number 7, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. So these people that say, hey, Jesus can come back at any minute, you know, there's been all sorts of books, the Left Behind series, 
There's been movies called Left Behind talking about this secret rapture that can happen. And then all, you know, all of a sudden we're just driving down the road and then cars are wrecking everywhere and planes are crashing everywhere. And, you know, you're at the grocery store and the guy at the checkout's ringing your, you know, groceries up. And all of a sudden he's not there and you look and there's a pile of clothes in the floor. People, this is fiction. It is not based in reality. It's not based in what the Bible teaches, okay? There is not going to be a secret rapture, okay? There's not going to be a secret rapture. Jesus can't come back at any minute. That's a false doctrine, the pre-trib rapture. But we see in Luke 21 that we can actually know that these events are nigh, that these events are coming, the events that are foretold in these chapters like Revelation 6, uh, uh, Mark 13, Luke 21, Matthew uh, 24. He said, well, I thought no man knows the day or the hour. No, they don't know the day or the hour. But we can know that these events are close. Let me give you an example. If I said, hey, I've got a friend, a, you know, a real good friend. He's going to come to church. He said that he would come to the church sometime in the fall. Okay. When's he going to come to church? Sometimes in the fall. Well, what day and what hour is he going to come? I don't know. I just know that he's going to come in the fall. So what would you be looking for you know, to expect my friend to show up at this church? You'd be looking for a fall, right? You'd look for the temperatures to cool off. You'd be looking for, you know, the leaves to start turning. That's what you would be looking for. You wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't say, well, nobody knows. You know, no man knows the day or the hour. No, they don't know the day or the hour, but they can know that it's close, that it's drawing nearer because of, uh, of the signs that are described, because of my, what I said, you know, as far as, hey, he's going to come in the fall. Now go to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and I want to show you some signs that the end is nigh. And number one is the falling away. The falling away. 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. You have Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Uh, I was taught to remember that. Uh, GEPC, General Electric Power Company. That might help you remember that. And then you run into the T books. You have 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, and then Titus. And we're in 2 Thessalonians. Verse number 1, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now that word, at hand, just means it's about to happen. Okay. So what Paul's saying, he's like, don't be shaken in mind that Jesus Christ's return is about to happen. It's at hand. Okay. So that, oh, uh, Jesus can come back at any minute. Hey, Paul's warning them against that kind of the talk, okay? He said he, that, that the day of Christ is not at hand. Look at verse number three. Let no man deceive you by any means. He says, for that day, what day? The day that Christ is going to come back shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So, He's saying that the day of Christ, it shall not come. It's impossible. It cannot come except uh, these conditions are met. And what are these conditions? Well, first off, it's a falling away first. And then secondly, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, and that's not to say that we can't leave here and we can't like, you know, this couldn't be your last day on earth. That's very possible, you know. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what this afternoon holds, you know. I could drop dead of a heart attack and there'd be a lot of happy people, you know. That's what I told somebody. I said, if somebody killed me, I said, they'd probably make a national holiday and give people a day off from work, you know, for it. But, uh, you know, this could be your last day on earth. You know, we could have a, a, a kind of a medical event. We could have a car crash. You know, you, you never know. But as far as for Christ to come back, that can't happen today. These, these conditions have to be met before that, uh, before that happens. Well, it says it can't come except there comes what? A falling away first okay and it cracks me up how all of these baptist preachers are like oh let's go back to the greek let's go back to the greek let's go back to the greek but they don't go back to the greek on this verse right and and it cracks me up let me tell you what the greek word is and i don't speak greek let me just tell you that i do not speak greek but you get all of these pastors and all of these bible college uh, uh you know professors that go back to the greek all the time but in this verse they're like well you know you know they just they don't want to go back to the greek they don't even want to touch that with a 10-foot pole Here's the Greek word, apostasia, okay? I don't speak Greek at all. I don't know the Greek language. I can't read you words in Greek, but I'm just going to, I'm going to dive into uncharted territory this morning, okay? And tell you that apostasia doesn't mean the rapture. Right. 
that apostasia means apostasy, okay? And you can email me if I'm wrong, you know, if somebody's listening out, or you can come to me after the service and say, oh, well, apostasy means the rapture. You can tell me that after the service, but I'm just going to go into uncharted territory. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that apostasia means apostasy, okay? And here's what apostate means, or apostasy. It's a person who renounces a religious or political belief or principle. And I believe that this falling away from religion is happening today. Yep. I really do. We're raising up generation that does not know the Lord like the Bible says in the book of Judges. It says there arose a generation that knew not the Lord. Out soul winning. We're running into kids that don't even know the name of Jesus Christ. They have no idea who it is. You know, yesterday's generation, people went to church. It's kind of what you did. And your average, you know, American, your average uh, person knew the stories of the Bible. They knew about Jonah and the whale. They knew about Daniel and the lion's den. They knew about Noah's ark. They knew the story of the crucifixion. They had a general knowledge and concept of what the Bible teaches. You know, I mean, and everybody talks about, oh, prayer in school and stuff. You know, I mean, it's better than nothing, you know. I mean, you know, should we have public school? That's the, that's the question. But... You know, I can remember growing up in school, I can remember them having the Ten Commandments. Several of the teachers that would have like a plaque with the Ten Commandments on that. You know, we, we've just fallen away as a nation, as a Christian nation, as a religious nation. We just, we're, we're raising a lot of pagan people nowadays, you know? People that just don't want to have anything to do with religion. People that don't want to have anything to do with church. They grow up their entire lives and they just exist and they consume and that's all they do. They don't, they're never challenged to think about religion and things like that. We're just running into a, a nation and running into a society that is not as religious as the previous generation. I really believe that we're experiencing this great falling away. Now go to Revelation chapter number 13. Revelation chapter number 13. So what has to happen before the end times, before the, these events start unfolding? There has to be a falling away. And I believe that we're experiencing that right now. Maybe we're on the, the, the you know, initial part of that. I don't think that necessarily that we're, you know, the, the, the Great Tribulation and these events uh, are going to unfold next year or the year after. But I'm telling you, folks, we are heading in that direction. You know, America is getting less religious. You know, churches are getting less religious. Churches are getting away from the Bible. Churches are getting away from Bible-believing uh, preaching. Churches are getting away with thus, well, you know, what thus saith the Lord. They start adopting this social gospel. They start adopting this, this moral code and this moral philosophy that's based on a, a lot of, you know, psychology and a lot of humanist ideas. And they're getting away from what the Bible teaches. We're becoming more uh, uh, of, a, of a heathen, apostate society. Revelation 13. So what else has to happen? A new world order, okay, has to happen. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse number 3, you say in Revelation 13, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, talking about the Antichrist. Now look at verse number 7 of Revelation 13. It says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, talking about the Antichrist, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jump down to verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehands, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. So six, six, six. So we see in verse number seven, it says that he's given power over all nations. That is a one world government. It is not God's plan that we have a one world government. It is God's plan that we have just several nations, that, that the world is divided into nations, sovereign nations that rule and govern them own, their own selves. It's not God's plan for us to have just one world, one nation, and all of these things. Okay, look at verse number 8. It says, all will worship him. Talking about a one world religion. Look at verse 16 through 18. It talks about a mark in, in, not on, in. A lot of false versions will say on their right hand or on their forehead, you know, like it's some sort of tattoo. And the King James Bible is very careful to say, 
that they have a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Talking about a one world currency. People, this is not some sort of conspiracy theory, okay? This is not tin foil hat wearing uh, uh, dialogue. This is what the Bible teaches, okay? But we see all of these things in 2019 funneling together. You look at the government, honestly, because the goal, the end goal before these events happen is a one world government, okay? Look at the United Nations, all of these trade agreements, all of these entangling alliances that our governments get involved with, all of these alliances, all of these treaties. Because you think about it, think about how much uh, foreign aid that we send to all of these countries. You know, when the Bible says that the borrower is servant unto the lender, look at us. How, how, how many billions of dollars do we owe China? You know, it's like the world system, the world governmental system uh, is just meshing, is funneling, and it's funneling people towards a one world government. That's what it's funneling towards. Because, you know, they have all of these agendas. You know, uh, we're going to combat the poor. We're going to combat uh, uh, the, the, the climate, you know, with global warming. You know, we have these global campaigns for different things. You know, we all need to join hands and join forces and join resources to combat poverty, to combat famine, to combat... Uh, uh, you know, climate change and things like that. So we see the meshing of governments that's happening right now before our eyes and has been happening for decades in the past. Now look at uh, the religion. Think about the religion because that's what we're, that's the, that's the end road is a one world religion. Think about religion nowadays. Everybody's trying to put aside their differences. You just think about just the, your, your, your Protestant, Baptist, uh, uh, you know, religions and denominations. There's no doctrine being taught. That's not on accident that there's no doctrine being taught in a lot of these churches where everything is vague, you know, coming down from headquarters in the Southern Baptist Church and these other denominational uh, uh, churches. There's no accident that no doctrine is being taught. If no doctrine is being taught, you know, because it, it's not enough that you should be taught what's right. You need to be taught what's wrong. I think it's interesting. I told my wife last night, I said, you know, there's these two boys that we know that they go to Catholic school, okay? They go to Catholic school, uh, you know, their, their, their parents are Catholic, and they went to a Baptist VBS, okay? Now, they go, and it's, hey, it's great, you know, Jesus saves, it's just faith only, you know? So they hear that message, and they receive that message, and then they go, and they also hear the, the Catholic version of that, that you have to keep the sacraments, you have to join the church and all of these other things. You know, make confession to the priest. So it's not enough that we teach people what is right, but we need to teach people what is wrong. Amen. You know, because, you know, the, the, the VBS workers, they have a responsibility, in my opinion, you know. They have a responsibility to say, hey, you know what? Salvation is by grace through faith, and you know what? Salvation by works that what the Catholics teach is wrong. You know, they have that responsibility to teach that, I believe. But, you know, they don't teach that. It's all just, hey, will you believe however you want to believe? You know, oh, well, that's just a Baptist doctrine, the salvation by grace through faith. That's just a Baptist doctrine. Oh, once saved, always saved. That's just a Baptist doctrine. You know, we just have differences of opinion, you know, but we can, we can agree on the big stuff like Jesus or the Trinity or, or what have you. No. These things are important, but it is a calculated plan of the devil that doctrine is not being taught. What is right and what is wrong, okay? Doctrine needs to be taught from the bull pulpit. Doctrine needs to separate this is right and the rest of this stuff is wrong. You say, well, you guys are so closed-minded. Yeah, I am closed-minded, okay? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. You know, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one way to heaven. It's through Jesus Christ. It's through putting all your faith on him. All other ways will send you to hell. I mean, how, 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 how divisive is that? You know, how exclusionary is that? It's very exclusionary. I mean, it's very divisive because there's only one right way and the rest of the ways are wrong. But you don't hear that in a lot of churches. A lot of churches, it's just, well, that's your way and that's your interpretation and all of that stuff. But that's a calculated plan of the devil to get things vague. Because if I'm vague, and I just, you know, and we can, we can, what, major on the minors or whatever they say. If I'm vague and I don't really teach any doctrine, and then the Lutheran dude down the street is vague, he doesn't teach any doctrine. I've not told my people, hey, uh, uh, work salvation's wrong and this and that, you know, and I've been very vague and I've just told our pre uh, people, hey, they're just, they believe a little bit different. 
then you can go and you can uh, worship and you can celebrate and you can, uh, you know, be a part of the Lutheran church. Oh, we're just a little bit different, you know. It is a calculated plan of the devil right. to try to get all religions Amen. funneled into one. And then you have false prophets like Billy Graham, you know, like the Pope. Billy Graham, may he burn in hell, okay, Amen. in the lowest hell because he's damned so many people to hell. You know, I don't say this because I woke up and just didn't like Billy Graham. Bill, I mean, people don't... Oh, he's just such a good preacher. I don't, I don't, I don't see how he, he wasn't a good preacher. Billy Graham preached that you had to turn from your sins to be saved. And let me tell you what turning from your sins is, okay? Turning from your sins is keeping the law. That's what it is. Because if you're a thief and you have to turn from being a thief to be saved, then you're obeying the commandment, thou shalt not steal. So what you're telling people when you tell them to, uh, you have to turn from your sins is you're telling them they have to keep the law to be saved Billy Graham is in hell. I hate, to, I hate to tell you that. I'm sorry he signed your Bible back in the 80s. You know, I hate that for you. But Billy Graham is burning in hell, and may he burn in hell for damning so many people to hell. Okay? That's where he belongs. He's a false prophet. The whole world loved him. Do you think that I'm going to be on the presidential prayer breakfast? Huh? Do you, you think that whoever gets elected in whatever year, uh, 2020 or whatever it is, do you think that I'm going to be up there laying hands on the president, praying for them? No. I, I, I wouldn't be able to get 10 miles from the president, you know, without getting aped by the Secret Service, okay? Billy Graham was loved by the world. Guess who else is loved by the world? The Pope. The Pope is loved by the world. The Pope is a false prophet. The Pope is a devil in a dress. That's what the Pope is, okay? Catholicism is a wicked religion. It is a wicked religion. Hocus pocus, uh, idolatrous religion that will send you to hell. Okay, but now what is this pope? This pope has been called the like the most inclusive pope. You know, he's breaking down these religious barriers. People, that is no accident that that's right. happening. That's right. It is no accident that Billy Graham, you know, and these famous preachers, they they they're accepting of these other religions. Billy Graham even said on a, on an interview, he said. Well, I think if people follow the light that they have, that philosophy has been just subtly put into to Christians' brains for decades and decades and decades. He was an instrument of the devil. He was an instrument of world one world religion, okay? Wake up and read the Bible. If somebody's telling you, oh, we need to break down these religious lines, no, we need to break, you know, uh, uh, put up religious walls because there's only one right way. Oh, I don't like that. Well, then go go hang out with Billy, okay? Because there's only one right way. Uh, two plus two equals what? Two plus two doesn't equal what? You know, they're having five, seven, 28. Oh, you can't just have one answer. Okay, I'm sorry. The two plus two has one answer. It's four. Hey, salvation has one answer. It's Christ. It's put all your faith on Christ. All of these other religions, it doesn't matter what religion it is. You know, well, how do you know that you all are right? Because mine points to Jesus Christ. Mine points and gives all the glory to God. All of these other religions point to people. You got to be a good person. And they just repackage that however they want to. You got to do works. You got to keep the sacraments. You got to pray. You got to go... Uh, you know, whatever, you know, confess to the pervert, whatever you got to do. All of them repackage and they put the focus on man. You understand that? Man. They put the focus and they put the burden of salvation on men. That's the problem with all of the other religions. All of them. You say, well, well about Christianity, you know, there's all these different denominations and different forms of Christianity like Baptist and this and that. No, there's not. Okay? I call myself a Baptist. Why do I call myself a Baptist? Number one, we baptize by immersion. Secondly, we believe in eternal security, which is just, you know, traditionally what Baptists believe. Because if you don't believe in, uh, in eternal security, then what are you thinking? Hey, I can lose my salvation, so I have to do something to keep it. That's what you're thinking. You're calling God a liar. And you fall into the category with the Catholics and the Muslims and the Buddhists and all of the other false religions that base their salvation on man. Let me read for you. This is called the Council of or the World Council of Religious Leaders, and it's not very long, but let me read this for you. This was back in 2002, okay? 
So the World Council of Religious Leaders aims to serve as a model and a guide for the creation of a community of world religions. It seeks to inspire women and men of all faiths in pursuit of peace and mutual understanding. It will undertake initiatives that will assist the United Nations and its agencies by providing the spiritual resources of the world's religious traditions in the prevention, resolution, and healing of conflicts and in addressing a global social and environmental problems. By promoting the universal human values shared by all religious traditions and by uniting the human community for times of world prayer and meditation, the Council seeks to aid in the development of the inner qualities and external conditions needed for the creation of a more peaceful, just, and sustainable world society. The role of religious leaders has never been more important in helping to set a new direction for the human community. The World Council will encourage the religious traditions of the United Nations to work in closer cooperation in building a community of the world's religions to work for the benefit of gl global family. All religions of the world will be uh, represented, as will the major faith traditions of Baha'i, I guess. I don't know. I don't even know how to pronounce it. I looked that up. It was like, pretty much it was like <laughs> Islam repackaged, okay? It, 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 was the, it was the Muslim that got mad and he went down the street. He took his toys and he went next door. He's not playing with them anymore. Buddhism, Christianity, Confucius, uh, Confucianism, Hinduism, indigenous, uh, whatever that is. I don't even know what he worship rocks, I guess. I don't know. I have to look that one up. Islam, Jainism, Judaism, Shinto, Sikhism, Taoism, and Zoroastrianism. Don't know what that one is either. It's like they say that's like one of the oldest religions and all this. Who knows? I'm tell I promise you, look all those up and it's all work salvation. I promise you that. But it's all getting funneled under our noses. It is all getting funneled. That's why, honestly, that's why I could walk, I could walk into a Southern Baptist church this morning, leave that Southern Baptist church. Next week I could go to a Presbyterian church, okay? Leave that church. Next week, I could go to a Pentecostal church, leave that church, and you know, they're all the same. They're all the same. They say the same stuff. It's the same relative message. It's the same social gospel. That's not by accident, people. That is purposeful. They want these religious walls and these religious barriers broken down. Why? Because it's going to eventually culminate into a one-world religion where, where the, the fake Baptists... Not us. We'll be getting arrested and getting killed. Okay, the, the, I'm telling you, the true Christians will, because that's why they get persecuted. That's why they get executed for the cause of Christ. Okay, but the fake Baptists, the Pentecostals, the Lutherans, the Presbyterians—they're going to be hanging out with who? With the Jews, with the Muslims, with the Catholics. It's all going to mesh into one, and it's happening right before our eyes. We see it every day. Now, what else did it talk about? It talked about uh, having the, the mark in your right hand or in your forehead, talking about a cashless society. Hey, you know, people from 100 years ago, if you would have explained to them about credit cards, they would have looked at you, you know, like you had two heads, you know? They wouldn't have understood that at all. But look at credit cards. I saw somebody the other day pay for something with their watch. They get their grocery. Anybody seen somebody do that? It's kind of weird. They were sitting there, and they're like, you know, I held mine up there, and they told me they needed me to actually pay for my stuff. I guess my Casio doesn't have any money on it. But, but yeah, I mean, literally, somebody, they get their groceries and stuff, and they had a watch, and they held their watch up to, you know, where you insert your debit card, or they held their watch up to that, and it scanned. And uh, I'm not saying that anything magical or anything like that. Obviously, they have money in account and all this. But we are virtually in a cashless society. Who has cash anymore? You know, the majority of people pay, you know, with, you know, debit cards, you know, watches, you know, who knows? I can't pay anything with my watch. I, I, I don't have any money on my watch, by the way. But, you know, you, you say, well, how, the, how can they just keep you from buying, okay? You know, there's exclusionary laws that are being passed right now. Brother Chris and I was talking about, they, they have this new ID coming out. It's called the Tennessee Real ID. Has anybody ever heard of that? Okay, the Tennessee Real ID, what that is, is it looks just like a driver's license, but it has like the state seal on it or something like that in it. Okay, a little star on it. Uh, you're the star of the show, right? So you get that ID, and without that ID, you can't fly. Now, you could have a passport. You could utilize a passport. But you have to have that real ID in order to fly. Is that correct? Yeah. And if you don't have that real ID, which includes like a background check and things like that, if you don't have that real ID, you're not flying at all. 
So already we see the groundwork being laid where they're restricting travel, okay? Where they're just putting these restrictions, and unless you meet this criteria, you can't partake. Unless you have the Tennessee Real ID, you can't fly, okay? So we see these uh, exclusionary laws being uh, passed. We see the groundwork being laid for all of this stuff. You know, it's great to sit there and be like, hey, I want to donate to this, and you just push a button, and, you know, and you can donate to, to, you know, to the church. That's great, you know. Or it's great to be just sitting on your couch, you know, and, uh, on, on Black Friday when everybody's just like trampling one another at the Walmarts and you're sitting on, on, on your couch and you got your, your cup of, of coffee and you're ordering from Amazon and you're ordering from these things, all of these Christmas presents and stuff that's going to get shipped to your home. Hey, technology's great, but this is just the groundwork, people, for them to, to be able to uh, limit you or exclude you from purchasing. You look at it, you know, we had our uh, uh, PayPal shut down, right? But you think about it. What if they shut our PayPal down? What if they shut our bank account down? What if they just shut everything down? You think about it right now. You, and, and you know, what, what, what I was going to say, this is brought to you by Capital One. I was fixing to say what's in your wallet, right? <laughs> so everything in your wallet, your debit card, you know, your, your gas card, your credit card, what, what, if I, what if I just went through and I shut off everything in your wallet right now? How long would you be able to make it? Honestly, you wouldn't be able to, able to make it long. You just don't have anything. You can't have access to anything. You not realize they can stop you from having access to anything. Okay, and and, and not to say, you know, we're going to say that you have to have a a a a wristband. You know, you have to have a wristband, and if you don't have this wristband, you can't go shopping in the store. That's what the mark of the beast is, people. They're going to put an RFID or whatever chip in your hand or in your forehead. And in order to get that, you have to worship the Antichrist. And if you don't have that, instead of the watch, you're going to be scanning your forehead or your hand. Okay? And if you don't have that and you go to the grocery store and your kids are starving at home, you're not going to walk out of the grocery store with anything. You can't purchase anything. Period. I mean, but we already have exclusionary laws, but people look at this and they're like, oh, that's sci-fi. It's not science fiction. It's going to happen. And they're already laying the groundwork for these type of things to happen. You know, it's happening right under our noses. And you know what? Americans are lining up and voting for it. They love it. They just love it. Oh, it's so great. We're going to be so safe. I mean, really? Okay. Go to uh, Luke 17. So, again, we, we see some of these things uh, about, you know, towards the end times. Obviously, we see the falling away. And I believe that we're becoming more of a godless nation, you know. You, you can't convince me that we're not more godless than we were 50 years ago. You know, 60 years ago, 100 years ago. You, you can't convince me of that. And we're heading, I mean, the, the groundwork's being laid for a one world government. You know, look at all of these summits, you know, the G2 summit, G10 summit, and all of this junk. Look at all of these summits that they have, that they have these global campaigns, these cooperative campaigns, these treaties, these alliances that are being formed all over the globe. And also the cashless society. I mean, we're literally here. I mean, it's just honestly probably a, a matter of some software and a little bit of hardware here. But, you know, they're getting these things going. Luke 17. What's another sign of the time? That's why we read the chapter before, because these are a couple that, you know, we generally don't pay attention to. Luke 17, verse number 26 says, As it was in the days of Noe, so, sh so it shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Now, keep a finger in Luke and go to Genesis chapter number 6. So let's look and see what the days of Noah were like. Go to Genesis 6. Look at verse number 4. Genesis 6, 4. The Bible reads, as it was, I'm sorry, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men that they bear children unto them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw, look at verse number 5, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So we see this time because God said in, in Luke 17, hey, just like the days of Noah, that's the way it's going to be, you know, whenever these, these events begin to unfold. And you look back in the days of Noah, and it says that the wickedness was great, and man's heart was in his imagination and his thoughts was evil continually. We live in a wicked day, people. We live in a day 
where literally while you're going, while you wake up and you go to work and you brush your teeth and you go to the grocery store and you play with your kids and you're playing outside the sprinkler and the kids are enjoying summer break, that each and every day 2,000 plus babies are killed, are murdered here on American soil in abortion clinics. Look at adultery. Adultery runs rampant and adultery is a wicked sin. So many people want to sit and they just want to focus on abortion or they just want to focus on, you know, something that's glaringly obvious that's socially acceptable, you know, to protest. But what about abortion or, or adultery? Adultery is a wicked sin. People toss away marriage all the time. People cheat on their spouses all the time. It is wickedness and it is, is just filled up to the brim America. Look at church attendance. Church attendance is on the decline. People just don't care. People go and, 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 you know, they're not getting any meat of the word. You know, they're going to church, just going through the motions. They're not there. They're not serious about the things of God. They don't care what the Bible says. They, don't, they, they care about what's going to happen at work. They care that there's gas in the tank of their car. They, they care about having the latest car, the latest phone, the latest gadget, the latest thing on TV. What am I going to binge watch on Netflix tonight? That's all they care about. Their mind is not on the things of God. That's why half the time you talk to somebody about the Bible and they look at you like you have two heads, like that you're just some kind of alien. Oh, you're just a religious zealot. Even at church. I've been in these churches, these watered-down churches, where these people, they just don't give a rip what the Bible says. They don't care. You know, I heard a, it was funny, I heard a sermon that, that Pastor Anderson preached. He was talking about, he said, these people just don't care. He said, because he said, checkmate in the sermon. And he said, of course, these people are not even playing chess. Who's heard, who heard it, that sermon? He said, these people are not even playing chess. You know, so it's not like that you can go and show your average Christian, hey, the Bible says this and the Bible, they don't care. They don't care. They don't give a rip. Hey, the, the, the Augusta National's on. Hey, I like watching some golf. Augusta National's on. Hey, NASCAR's on. And, you know, Billy Bob is, is Billy Bob's really driving good this year. Hey, the Bassmasters is on, and I love to fish. Hey, the NFL's on, and, and I, I don't know. I don't even know anything about football. I was going to make a football joke, but I really don't know. I, I barely even know the teams. You know, I asked somebody, I said, is Joe Montana dead the other day? And they're like, what? <laughs> he's like, a, he's like a, a, a quarterback for like the 80s. They don't care. People just don't care. They're so consumed and they're so blind. And that's what the Bible teaches. He said, whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine in them. Okay? And they should be saved. But we live in a wicked and perverse generation. Look at all these mass shootings. All these shootings that happen. Look at all the molestation that goes on. Let me tell you something. Constantly constantly and you don't read about these things in the paper molestation goes on constantly kids are getting molested constantly day in and day out multiple cases and that's just in little old Knox County how many counties are there in the United States how much molestation goes on that doesn't it's never even reported huh this land is filled with wickedness. This land is filled with people that have gotten away from the Bible, people that don't have a moral compass. They're, the, they're, they're, the, they're their own Bible. They're their own moral compass. It is a wicked and perverse generation that we live in. Because why? Because the previous generation was lazy. The previous generation had their eyes on this world. The previous generation wanted their boats and their campers and their leisure times and their 401k and their golf clubs and they didn't give a rip about church and they're raising up a generation that is perverse, that is crooked, that is falling away from religion, that has no morals and they're wicked as hell. And that's what the Bible teaches. And you know what? Hey, we're, getting, we're heading in that direction into the days of Noah. You think about how bad it was. God was like, you know what? Hey, the earth's so wicked, I'm just going to flood the entire planet. Think how bad that was. And you know what? We're heading there, people. We are going in that direction as a nation. And guess what? As a globe, we are going in that direction. Proverbs 21, verse number 2 says, Every way, way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Ezekiel 44, verse number 23, it says, They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane and cause them to discern between the clean, unclean and the clean. 
Churches everywhere are compromising. Go back to Luke 17 real quick. Churches everywhere are compromising. That's what I told my wife. Back when we was like looking for a church, I, I, I told her, I said, is it not enough? I mean, is it enough to ask or too much to ask to just go to church and hear the truth? To go to church and hear the truth, is that just too much to ask? I mean, I expect if I turn on a TV that I'm going to get lied to. I expect that if I get on Facebook and I start trolling through there that I'm going to get lied to. I expect that if I pick up a magazine, I'm going to get lied to. I've been lied to by magazines for years. You know, hey, do these five workouts and you're going to have a six-pack, right? <laughs> hey, if that don't tell you magazines are going to lie to you, nothing will. you got to eat less, guys. Okay? But people are going to, you're going to lie. But you know what? Hey, the church ought to be the pillar and ground of the truth. When you walk through that door and you sit down, I should be telling you the truth. You should hear the truth. It doesn't matter if it stings. You should be able to hear the truth. Okay? You should hear the truth about uh, sin. You should be hear the truth about what the Bible says. You shouldn't be snowed. You, shouldn't wa you should leave more knowledgeable and leave hearing the truth whenever you go to church. I should show you a difference between the clean and the unclean. I should show you a difference between the holy and the unholy, and churches are not doing that nowadays. Churches nowadays are telling people, well, I mean, as, as long as you don't get drunk, you can drink. You know, it's okay. I'm telling you, there's church people that rejoiced everywhere whenever they passed wine sales in Tennessee or in Knox County. I don't know if it's the whole state wine sales in grocery stores. That way they wouldn't have to like put on sunglasses and a ball cap when they went to the liquor store to get their wine. They could just hide it under the under the rolls in the in the in the and their their produce and go to the grocery stores and get it. Well it's wine. Jesus drank wine. You know? Drinking wine's wicked. How about that? It's wicked and it's drunkenness. And you know what? You you go drink wine and destroy your life. You go have a few sips. Because you know what? In 10 years, you're not going to be having a few sips. Your life's going to be destroyed, and you're going to be having a few bottles. I can't tell you how many people that I've worked their death where I showed up, and this person is alone, and you can't find any family members because they burn all their bridges. And guess what's everywhere? Wine bottles. All of those boxes. You know what I'm talking about? Those boxes of wine. Wine bottles everywhere. This one lady had this one liquor bottles, and she, she, she had died. She had passed away from just, you know chronic alcoholism. By herself, we couldn't find any family members, and there's just all these bottles. We call it, uh, uh, what do we call it? Gut rot is what somebody <laughs> called it. The guy that I was with, he evidently was familiar with that liquor that she was drinking. And he's like, oh, man, she's drinking the gut rot. You think, you, do you think that that lady, I mean, this lady was like 80, drinking gut rot. You think that lady, you know, you know 70 years ago, whenever she's partying with her friends, do you, you think that she thought, hey, I'm going to drink gut rot until I die. No. Don't drink alcohol. Alcohol is deceitful. Amen. Alcohol will take a hold of you, and you're going to be a drunk that's going to lose everything. You're going to destroy your life. Alcohol will destroy your life. Right. Now, Luke 17, verse number 28. But I'm telling you, we're getting wicked, just like in the days of Noah. We see that wickedness abounding. What else? Luke 17, verse number 28. It says, Likewise also was it in the days of Lot, they did eat, and they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But in the same day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Go to Genesis 19. Genesis chapter number 19. So Jesus also says, hey, you know, you want to know if it's getting close? It's going to be just like in the days of Noah. You go back, you look at the days of Noah, it talks about wickedness, violence, wickedness that's going on. And then he also said, hey, it's going to be like in the days of Lot. So let's go back to the days of Lot and see what it was like then. Verse number four, Lot takes these angels in. These angels are like trying to hang out around the street. And he's like, hey, don't, don't stay in the street. Come stay with me. He says, but before they lay down, he said, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, come past the city around, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know him. They wanted to carnally know them to commit the wickedness with them. It said, and Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. And said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do you to them as good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore they came under the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. 
and they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break down the door. So these sodomites is what this is talking about. These men, these angels came, they were staying with Lot, and these sodomites, they, they circled the, the, the house where they were in, and they're like beating at the door, and they wanted, they said, hey, send these dudes out that we can know them. They wanted to know them carnally. They wanted to lie with them. Why? Because they were sodomites, okay? And Lot's like, hey, don't do this. This is wicked. I'll give you my daughters. They didn't want the daughters. They're like, hey, you're trying to judge us. Hey, that sounds familiar, doesn't it, right? Hey, you're trying to judge us. So the angels, they, 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 they actually had to smite these men with blindness and all of this other stuff. But they were just persistent. They're implacable. They're unmerciful. Uh, they were trying to get to them. So, okay, so what do we have abounding in the story in the days of Lot? Sodomy, right? Sodomites. That's what we have abounding. What did we just finish up last month? Pride month. Gay pride month. Okay? Today's wickedness isn't just excused. Okay? It's celebrated, isn't it? Sodomy, being a sodomite, is celebrated. Look at public schools. You're hearing this stuff pop up all over people. Pop up to where they're starting to teach kids, hey, you know, you know, Billy had two daddies and, and, you know, and all of this filth that they're teaching kids in public school. So while you're sitting there and, and, you're, and you're, you're sending your kids, you know, little Johnny to public school, and you think, oh, well, he's in good hands at public school. You know, that, that's okay. He's in the good hands. They're teaching him his ABCs. They're teaching him math. They're teaching him fractions, you know, uh, uh, and, and all of these great things. And he needs this education. While he's doing that, they're also teaching him that sodom, being a sodomite is okay, that being a homo is okay. They're teaching him that that's okay. That, hey, if, you, if, you, if you're a boy and you feel like that you think you might should be a girl, hey, that's okay. You know, all of this gender fluidity, or fluidity, I guess, all of this gender bending junk that they teach kids, it is wickedness yep. and it's going on today in society. President T Trump tweeted back last month, he says, the United States has a global campaign to decriminalize homosexuality. President Trump tweeted that. You know, so all of these Baptists, I can, I can think two years ago, and I'm not going to call his name, but two years ago, he's talking about, hey, you know, we need to vote for Trump. You know, Baptist church that I attended, what, three years ago, Brother Aaron went there with me. Hey, we need to vote for Trump. You know, hey, we need to stand to get this wicked Hillary. Oh, really? Well, what are they saying now? Are they piping up now that he's just celebrating being a sodomite, being a homo pervert? Is that, where are they at now? Where's their Make America, uh, uh, well, I can't even think of it now. I want to say great, okay, I want to say straight. Where are they now, honestly? Where are they now, you know, uh, pounding their chest? Hey, vote for Trump. Vote. Trump's wicked, right. okay? Amen. He's wicked, and he's always been wicked. He was wicked from day one. Right. But Fox News told you not to think that. Your fundamental pope told you not to think that, you know? So uh, it's not socially acceptable. Oh, you're a Baptist, then you're a Republican. I can't remember how many, how many comments that I've had on our YouTubes and, and messages eh, spoken like a Trump supporter. I didn't support Trump. Chump, right? I didn't vote for him. I didn't vote for anybody. Why? Because they're all wicked. Right. Amen. Well, it's the lesser of two evils. Okay. Pope Pot, okay? Pope Pot, the, the, the guy from Cambodia, the dictator from Cambodia that murdered all sorts of his people. Pope Pot and Joseph Stalin are, we're going to resurrect them and they're going to run for president. Who are you going to vote for? Huh? Joseph Stalin, who like butchered and killed millions of his own countrymen in Russia. Who are you going to kill? Or who are you going to vote for? Huh? What are the lesser of two evils? Well, who killed more people? I mean, honestly, what a, what a, what a stupid philosophy. Right. Hey, the lesser of two evils is evil. That's right. Amen. I'm not voting for evil. Amen. Uh, if you don't vote, you, can say, you can't say anything. Yes, I can. I didn't vote, so I can say something all day long. I can squawk Amen. all day long because I think all of it's wicked. Right. Amen. You know? A, 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 a no vote is a vote. Right. It's saying, you know what? Your system's stupid. You know what? Your candidates are a joke. Yep. That's what that no vote says. And you know what? I'll vote. I probably will never vote ever again in my life. I don't care. I mean, why? What a waste of time. I got better things to do, you know? I, I, I mean, I'll go pet my cat, you know? <laughs> if it's voting day and I have absolutely nothing to do, I'm just going to sit and I'm just going to hang out with my cat. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'll pet my cat or give it some little kitty treats or something. I promise you I can find something better to do. I'll, I'll go to a horse farm and pick up dung, you know, before I would go vote. Amen. What a waste of time. And if you vote, I mean, 
I, was, I don't care. I'm not mad at you. They, uh, the House passed an Equality Act. Recently, it's an anti-discrimination bill. 236 yeas to 173 nays. So at least, I mean, maybe there's 173 people that have potential, maybe. You know, who knows? It says it protects the LGBT under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity is unlawful. So that passed the House uh, very recently. Why are there more sodomites right now? Why is that ramping up? Why is that becoming more prevalent? Because there's more people that hate God. They go hand in hand, okay? Look at all the censorship issues that go on. You know, you post anything that, that, that goes contrary to this whole sodomite agenda, they'll take it down, won't they? They'll take it down, they'll censor it, you've got a strike on your account and all of these things. And people are like, yeah, you need to shut them down. You don't know what you're asking for. Censorship is not good at all. Censorship is just is withholding information from persons. That is not good at all. You say, oh, do you think that atheists should have a platform? Sure. I don't care. Wear it out. Do you think that the, the sodomites should have a platform? Well, they should be dead. Okay, so I mean, I, I, I'm good. I, I, I'm good with that. You know, if you'll do what the Bible says, you know, and have the government arrest them and prove that, you know, that they've lied with a man and then kill them. I, I, I can promise you if the government enforced Leviticus 2013 like they ought to, there's not going to be anybody on YouTube saying, hey, I'm a homo. Right. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. So we wouldn't even have to worry about censorship issues. But let me tell you something. It is a bad thing whenever they censor information. That is not a good thing at all. That's like stuff that they do in, 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 you know, in communist China. You don't want censorship to happen in your life. So you know, even things that I don't agree with, I don't think that there ought to be censorship of those things. Censorship is bad. And the problem is, is you know, if you give the government a signed check, they're going to fill in the amount. If you give them your permission and you're like, oh, yeah, you, can, you censor those Christians, you know, and, and you give them the authority to do that, and these companies the authority to, to practice censorship with your approval, with your standing ovation, all they have to do is just fill in the amount. And guess what? Maybe your platform gets censored tomorrow, you know. Maybe what, you know, maybe your watered-down Christianity gets censored tomorrow. And you know what? Hey, you asked for it. So we shouldn't support any sort of censorship. Now go to Second Peter chapter number 2. So what should we do about all this? So we see all these things coming together. And I'm telling you, if you don't see these things coming together... The wickedness, the, the, the world's getting wickeder, the United States is getting wickeder, that sodomy is abounding all across this nation, that there's an agenda to promote uh, homosexuality, you know, all the way, and, you know, from the public school to the government buildings to the workplace to the corporations. I mean, it's, and it's global. If you don't see that and you don't see that, you know, we're heading toward a cashless society, where it could be a one world currency, where it could be a one world government, where we could come into a one world religion. If you don't see that these things are all, everything is funneling together, okay? If you don't see that, you need to, I mean, you need to wipe the, the glaze off your eyes, okay? So what should we do about it? Look at 2 Peter uh, 2, because the Bible says it's kind of like in the days of Noah. Let's see what Noah did. 2 Peter 2, verse 5, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person. Look what it says. He says he's a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world, of the ungodly. It says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. We need to be preachers of righteousness. We need to be examples of righteousness. We need to, because what did Noah do? Noah preached righteousness and then Noah worked on the ark. What did the ark represent? Salvation. And the ark had what? One door. So we need to be building that ark of salvation. We need to be pointing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be out soul winning and say, hey, you want to get saved? From the coming, uh, uh, you know, from hell, you want to get saved from the coming judgment? Hey, get on this, get on this boat, get on this salvation, you know, and enter through the door of Jesus Christ of faith alone. So we need to be doing that. We need to preach righteousness. We shouldn't be lackadaisical in our Christian lives. You know what? Hey, there's not a person in here without sin. There's not a person in here that doesn't have bad days and don't have days, you know, where we just kind of blow it. But you know what? We need to strive to be better. We don't need to just be acceptable. Oh, this is me, just you know, uh, just as I am, you know, without one plea, right? 
Uh, I'm going to live, I can't even think of another thing. I, I'm, a, I'm a terrible uh, poet or rapper, one, <laughs> right? But we don't need to have this attitude of, oh, this is me. Always strive to be better. What's the goal? Jesus Christ, that's the goal, to be perfect. God says, be ye holy as I am holy. How holy is God? He is without sin. We should strive each and every day to try to be better, to, to forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. He says, hey, let us lay aside the sin and the weight that doth so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. We need to try to strive to be better, preach righteousness, not be complacent, not be accepting. We need to call sin, sin. We need to make sin exceedingly sinful. We don't need to be accepting of all of this wickedness that goes on. Also, as in the days of Lot, Luke 17, you can jump back there. Luke 17, Genesis 19, verse number 24, I'll read for you. It says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Luke 17, uh, verse number 32 says, Remember Lot's wife. There's a lot of meaning that's packed into those little three words. Remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife was what? She was numb to evil. She was numb to the wickedness that was going on around her. She was in love with the world, you know, and we need to fall out of love with the world. We need to fall out of love with wickedness. And you know what? We don't need to be numb to wickedness. We don't need to be just numb and be like, oh, well, I'm just watching these movies. They don't affect me. I'm watching these TV shows. They don't affect me. Uh, you know, I'm hanging out with all of my wicked friends, you know, that are drinking and partying. It doesn't affect me. Hey, remember Lot's wife, because what happened to Lot's wife? She was so in love and so enraptured and so numb to the sin there, you know, she actually thought it was okay to kind of, you know, look back and kind of hang out. Uh, or, or, you know, her heart. She left her heart in Sodom, right? Not San Francisco, which is about the same thing, right? But who's going to turn around in your family? You know, that would be a big question. Who's going to turn around in your family? Honestly, you might be on fire for God. I might be on fire for God. But, I mean, is your wife on fire for God? Ladies, is your husband on fire for God? Honestly. Because you, th you think about Lot. Lot wasn't on fire for God, obviously, you know? But he's leaving out there, and his wife, he was such, such a, a joke, he tried to get his son-in-law saved. and said they looked at him as one that mocked. So these angels tell him, hey, we're going to destroy the city. And he tells his son-in-laws, and they're like, well, it's just Lot. And why would they believe him? Because Lot's life had been a joke up to that point. But you're escaping out of the city. You imagine that. You, 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 you're living worldly. You're escaping out of the city. And, and your wife is so in love with the things of this world. She's so in love with the TV shows. She's so in love with the movies. She's so in love with all of her worldly friends that she turns around while you're trying to get out of there. And you lose her. She turns into a pillar of salt. Remember Lot's wife. What about your kids? Huh? You're trying to escape? You're trying to escape the, this world, the condemnation of this world? What about your kids? Are your kids going to turn around? Are, your kids, are you, are you going to be by yourself? Whenever you get out of this, you know, this mess, are you going to be by yourself? I mean, are your kids going to be a pillar of salt? Is your wife going to be a pillar of salt? We need to fall out of love with the world. This world is going to pass away. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through, as the song says. We need to sing that song. I've quoted it like several, past several sermons. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, as the song goes. We need to stop thinking about this world. Stop thinking about our 401ks. Stop thinking about having fun. Start, stop loving this world. You know, I mean, what are you going to watch? You know, you're like, oh, I love movies. What are you going to watch? Batman Part 12? Because I promise you, when I'm old, I'm telling you, when I'm old and, 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 and you know, here in probably 30, 40 years, it's going to be like, hey, they're coming out with a new movie. It's Star Wars. <laughs> Rebooted for the sixth time. It's Batman Part 12. It's the same garbage. And let me tell you something. It's the same garbage, and here's how they get to you, okay? They have all of this nostalgic stuff, you know, oh, we're going to reboot, you know, Ghostbusters. Somebody, they rebooted Ghostbusters, evidently, and it was like girls. How is it girls? The Ghostbusters were dudes, okay? You can't, you can't replace dudes with girls, okay? Sorry, ladies. Ghostbusters are guys, okay? 
But they reboot this stuff, and then, you know, all of, all of you know, the, the, the former generation that kind of grew up with these movies are like, oh, man, I just, I loved, uh, you know, whatever, Ghostbusters when I was little, or, you know, or, or Indiana Jones, or whoever. And then you go there, because of this nostalgia, and, and they're doing this with the Disney movies, too, because they're making live-action Disney movies, you know. You go there because of nostalgia, but what you don't realize is that when you watch that movie 30 years ago, that the world's gotten a whole lot wickeder in the past 30 years, and all of that wickedness is going to be infused into that movie. So you're there, and you're like, yeah, man, this makes me feel like I'm a little kid again. And they're just programming your brain with a lot of their filth that goes on. You ain't missing something, nothing watching these movies, okay? These movies are stupid. Siskel and Ebert gives them all two thumbs down, okay? They're not good. They're not good on you. What you and, and let me tell you, what you don't pick up on is probably worse than what you do pick up on. They all have agendas to make you worse, to make you wickeder, to accept sodomy, to accept all sorts of filthy things. But you need to get that junk out of your life. You need to get the TV out of your life. You need to stop binge-watching all these filthy Netflix shows. You need to get this junk out of your head. You need to get this world out of your head because you don't want to turn around and turn into a pillar of salt. Uh, and guys, you don't want your wives to turn around and turn into a pillar of salt. And parents, you don't want your kids to turn around and turn into a pillar of salt. Okay? Because like, like we've shown the whole sermon, things are heading there, aren't they? Hey, we're closer now than we were when I was a kid. Tomorrow we're going to be closer to it than, than today. And you know, I know that makes sense, but we can actually see these things unfolding. You imagine telling somebody, like I said, 150 years ago, 200 years ago, about a cashless society. What would they say? Wow, you know, that, that makes zero sense. You imagine telling somebody 200 years ago about that we're going to have a one world religion. They'd tell you no. No, there's no way. But things have just, you know, I mean, just exponentially grown and began to funnel in that direction towards a one world everything. We see it unfolding. We see the world getting wickeder day in and day out. It's just like in the days of Noah. It's just like in the days of Lot. So I'm telling you, hey, we need to be watchful. Okay, hey, we're saved, but you know what? Hey, we need to get as many people on that ark as we can. We need to get as many people on that ark as we can. We need to stay true to the Bible. We need to preach righteousness. We need to preach against the sodomites. We need to preach for holiness. We need to preach for these things, okay? And not realize and not uh, or just be like, oh, well, it's just going to happen. I heard somebody make that statement the other day. Oh, well, there's always been sodomites, so I, I, I will, I'm not going to take a stand on them. Oh, there's always been sin in the world, so I'm just not going to take a stand on it. No, we don't need to have that attitude. We need to have the attitude of, hey, I want to try to bring as many people to righteousness and to Christ as I possibly can because, hey, I can see that this world is it, it's drawing to a close. I'm not saying things are going to happen in my, in my lifetime. Who knows? But, you know, they're getting there, aren't they? They're getting a lot closer than they were, and we see that, that you know, all of the, the framework being laid for these things. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the warnings of your word. And God, we thank you that, uh, you know, that we, we have these things. Lord, please just help us to heed the example of Noah, Lord, and preach righteousness, God, and to get many people saved. Lord, I pray, God, that we can not be offended, Lord, that we'll stay the course and, and continue in your, your word. And Lord, and just try to continue to serve you, God, as things get worse. And uh, God, we thank you for your protection, Lord, and we thank you for your, your strength in these dark times, Lord, and just help us to stay strong. In Jesus Christ's name I pray.